Hey guys, it's John here from Sunny Drive Studio. I hope you're all doing well. Today I want to do a little FAQ or basically a most frequently asked questions just to answer some questions that do come up often in the comment sections under my videos. So let's have some fun and just get started right away. Now one question that I do get asked a lot is what is my favorite amplifier? And believe it or not, that's not an easy question to answer because I don't like picking favorites. I guess that's one of the reasons why I've got about 52 guitar amplifier heads, right? It's so that I don't have to pick a favorite, okay? I just like having all of these different flavors at my disposal, kind of like a real-life XFX or Helix, a real-life modeler with actual tube amps. I will, however, do my best to give you guys a proper answer. One of the amps that never, ever, ever lets me down is my trusty Angle Fireball 100 that I have over here in my rack. So that's probably one of my all-time favorite amplifiers, at least in my collection. Anytime I use it, it just sounds amazing and it does everything that I need from it. The cleans and push cleans are very nice. I just love how sort of sparkly the clean tones are. And I love the crunch that you can get when you crank the gain on the clean channel as well. And the lead channel for the heavy tones is to die for. It's very clear but raw sounding with plenty of gain on tap with a huge but still tight low end. And the mid-range just has a very huge roar to it that sounds huge in a mix, basically. So the low end is very tight, but not super tight, so it still has a sort of organic low end to it. And that makes it really versatile, in my opinion. And that's why I think that it works so well for so many genres and so many riffs that I like to write on various guitars, from six strings to baritones to seven strings, eight strings, and even nine string guitars. There aren't a lot of amplifiers that can handle that wide range of tunings, without needing an external boost pedal of sorts. However, I also got the Angle Powerball 2 last week, which is a really cool amplifier, and maybe that will dethrone the Fireball 100, but that remains to be seen. I'm currently working on a review slash demo video for that amplifier, which will be absolutely insane, by the way, so stay tuned for that. But yeah, we'll find out soon if that amp will dethrone the Fireball 100. Stay tuned. Some other amps that I really love would be my Orange Rockerverb 50 Mark III. I just love that high gain orange tone, so thick and saturated, just absolutely awesome and very unique sounding as well. And of course I also absolutely love my Mesa Boogie dual rectifier head over there. There's nothing in my collection that sounds like it, it's also a very unique sounding amplifier. It's a classic tone, everybody knows it, some people hate it, a lot of people love it, I really love that big and fat and sizzly and scooped rectifier tone. I guess rectifiers will always have a special place in my heart. Now I really want to pick more amplifiers because I've got so many cool pieces in this collection, but I will stick to those three for now, just for the purpose of this video. Now another question that also comes up naturally is what my favorite lunchbox amplifier is. And as you can see, I love lunchbox amplifiers a lot. I think they're charming. They sound great and they're obviously portable and small and they have a low wattage so they're very usable usually at low levels and great for recording. And they also tend to be more affordable so they're not super expensive in general with some exceptions. Now there are so many nice lunchbox amplifiers out there nowadays and I have some great ones in my collection including my Friedman Double J Jr. My PRS MT15, you just can't go wrong with that amplifier. The Orange Terror Amps. The Marshall Studio Series amplifiers, you know, the 20 watt Marshalls. However, for rock and metal, it's pretty hard to beat the Angle Fireball 25 when it comes to the bass tone. Now, I think that it makes sense that I love that Launchbox amplifier a lot because it has the same tonal DNA as the Fireball 100 that I just talked about, of course. But of course, it's a bit smaller and it does have some nice features as well. So if I could only pick one, I guess I would pick the Fireball 25 by Angle Amplification. And that's just for my personal taste and needs, of course. Now, of course, I gotta stress this is all hypothetical because I do not have to pick a favorite. People also ask me all the time which amplifier they should get. And then they usually give me a list of amplifiers that they are looking at. And very often those are lunchbox style amplifiers. But obviously that's very hard to answer because that depends on a bunch of factors. Mainly your taste, of course, also your requirements regarding the feature set of the amplifier, 
How many channels do you need? What sort of features do you need? Do you need an effects loop? What sort of wattage do you need? And all that good stuff. And of course, your budget also is very important. I mean, a Marshall DSL 20HR is much more affordable than a Friedman Double J Junior. If you're into simple amps with a classic rock crunch, perhaps look at the Marshall SC20H, one of the Wong's amplifiers for a higher wattage. If you're really into that Mesa rectifier sound, perhaps look into the Mesa Boogie Mini Rectifier 25. Or if you're on a budget and you need something that goes loud and is great for rock and metal, look at the PRS MT15, etc, etc. So there's no easy way to answer that question. Another question that people ask me from time to time is what my favorite guitar is. And again, it's not a very easy question to answer, but I will do my best for you guys. If I had to pick one of all my guitars, I would absolutely pick my Gibson Les Paul Custom that I got a couple of months ago. It's just such a killer guitar. It looks amazing and gorgeous. It plays great and it sounds awesome too. It's just an amazing guitar and it really inspires me to play and write more and more and more music. I sincerely hope that I'll never ever let that guitar go. I have made that mistake before and I've really regretted it. So yeah, that would be my number one pick right now. However, I also would not want to live without my Ibanez M80M Meshuga 8-string because it's such a great 8-string guitar with such a unique sound. I also wouldn't want to live without my purple ESP LTD 7-string baritone Stefan Carpenter model with the single Fishman Fluence pickup in it, the SC607B1H. And another guitar that I really love and I like to use that one a lot is my ESP LTD NW44 Neil Westfall model with the single bridge pickup in it, the bare knuckle aftermath pickup in fact which is a great sounding pickup. I also really like my Gibson Les Paul Standard for those more classic rock tones, it's also a killer guitar, and my ESP LTD Phoenix Black Metal is also one of my favorites. Again a single pickup guitar. So I guess you could say that I kind of like single pickup guitars. Anyway, so those are some of my favorite guitars that I'll never ever get rid of, I hope. Another question that comes up from time to time is how I write my riffs. Well, usually I write my riffs in my head while I'm doing random things, so not even with the guitar in my hand. At least the main groove. I have a little voice recorder app on my phone that I use to record my riffs with, with my voice, basically. Sometimes at very awkward moments, I must add, when I'm putting my kids to bed, for example, you know, I'm reading a book like la 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 and then ah crap, sorry, sorry, I gotta record a little riff here. Or when me and my girlfriend are about to go to sleep, that's also pretty awkward sometimes. Sorry babe, just gotta record a little riff before we go to sleep. But yeah, I can let you guys hear how it sounds basically. I think on this phone, which I've had for about two years, I've got about a thousand ideas. Let's take a listen to my most recent one. So that's actually a riff that I worked on today on my 8-string guitar. I actually made that into a song and that's how it usually happens. It may sound a bit goofy and weird, but it's actually a very effective way for me to write music. And other times I just write riffs while I'm playing guitar, which is also just a normal way of coming up with riffs, I guess. But usually the best ideas come from my head uh, just out of nowhere, basically. And if a riff sounds and feels good in my head, or at least the rhythm of it, that's a good sign that a riff will actually work in real life as well. And one thing that has really helped me out, especially in recent years, is just to let open the floodgates of my musical ideas without having any judgment of the ideas, without being overly skeptical or critical of all the ideas, just go with the flow of the music and see where it ends, basically. And just letting them manifest itself without any judgment or without me interfering, basically. I don't know if that makes sense, but for me it's very freeing and it makes me very um, productive. And I think that that's usually how the best ideas come about for me anyway. People also like to ask me a lot about how I program my drums. Now in short, I program everything in Cubase 12, which is the newest version of Cubase that I'm using right now. And the drum program that I like to use is Stephen Slade Drums 5.5 currently. It's just very easy to work with and it's also very easy to make it sound great. I also own many of the Superior Drummer STX libraries and those also sound great and very realistic and they're also very complex. However, whenever I try using those, 
I usually gravitate back towards SSD5 because it's just so easy to use and it's just easy to get creative with it. Having said that, I have a new studio project coming up with a great singer, Sven. He's a great guy and it's going to be a great project, by the way. But for that project, I'm actually using a blend of Steven Slade drums and Superior Drummer. So the kick and snare will be from Steven Slade drums and all the rest from the Progressive Foundry library in Superior Drummer. Stay tuned for that project, by the way, because it's going to be killer. And when I program the actual drum parts, I always do that by hand in the drum editor in Cubase. So I never use pre-programmed drum grooves or MIDI grooves or anything like that. I always do everything by hand from scratch. It's just way too much fun for me to program drums and it's just such a big part of the creative process. So I think that I'll always keep doing that whenever I don't have a drummer at my disposal. And I don't think that I'll ever use pre-programmed drum loops. Nothing against that at all, but it's just not for me. Sometimes when I get a basic groove down for a riff, I will do some copy pasting when it's like eight bars. I'll program like two bars and then copy it a couple of times. But then I usually go back to edit some things and change things around to make it sound a bit more interesting and realistic. And also change some fills here and there to make it more, you know, interesting. And recently I've also been using a cool function or feature in Cubase, which is the MIDI modifier function. And you can use that to sort of humanize your drum tracks a little bit in terms of velocity and note positions. So that's a great way to make everything sound a little bit more realistic. Another question that comes up a lot is how I'm able to afford all of these amplifiers and guitars. And well, it basically is a matter of working very hard and having your priorities in the right place. For some of you, it may seem like I'm super rich or something like that, but that couldn't be further from the truth, actually, because this is, in fact, my passion, my job and my hobby. So a lot of my attention and sort of resources go towards this. So basically all my money, aside from the money that goes to my family for food and stuff like that, goes towards my studio and my gear. Now, I also receive gear from companies from time to time to make videos with. So not everything on these shelves has been paid for by me, but a very big portion of it has been. But some of the amplifiers here are used. Others are quite affordable as well. So it's not as costly as some of you might think it is. I also don't have a car or a driver's license. So that also helps. And I almost never go out drinking with my friends. So that's also sort of money saver. So I guess working hard and prioritizing is a big part of it. People also often are curious what I do for a living. And I'm very happy to say that this is my full time job being a YouTuber, basically. So creating YouTube videos basically is my job, but I also do mixing jobs for bands, reamping and stuff like that, and other various media creation jobs. Quick side plug, by the way, if you want me to mix your music for a great price, but with great professional results, hit me up because I love mixing music. It's basically a passion of mine and it's a great way to get creative. So of course, let me know if you'd be interested in that. Okay, that will be all for now. If you have any questions for me that you'd like me to answer in a future FAQ, please drop them in the comment section down below. And who knows, I might answer your question in the future. That's all for this video. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please consider hitting the like, subscribe and notification bell options because that really helps the channel out. I'd hugely appreciate that. And you can also follow us on Android Studio on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you guys very, very soon. Cheers.